Good morning. It's time to begin our worship hour here at the Smyrna Church Building in Cookville, Tennessee. Thank you for joining us. Our first song this morning before our opening prayer and scripture reading will be number 17. 17, above the bright blue. <clears throat> There's a beautiful place called heaven. It is hidden above the bright blue. Where the good who from earth ties are riven. Live in love and eternity through. The scripture reading this morning will be taken from Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 34. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. 
And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? After all these things, for after all these things Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow, tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day in its own trouble. Will you bow with me, please? Lord, we thank you for another day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the wonderful sacrifice that you made on our behalf, Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. We thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you for the many blessings every day that you bless us with for you bless us with so much we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to worship you we pray that as we worship this morning our worship will be pleasing to you lord we pray that those that are sick and suffering that you would bless them in a special manner lord return them to their health if it be thy will continue to be with us and watch over us and care for us for this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 283. 283. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be
We as Christians are commanded to partake of the Lord's Supper the first of every week. Let us give thanks for this opportunity. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread which represents Christ's body broken on the cross. As we partake of it, let us do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, the fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood shed on the cross. Let us, let us partake in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. Before our giving, we'll be singing the first verse of 496, Sweet By and By. 496. <clears throat> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it upon, for our Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling. Separate and part of the Lord's Supper are also commanded to give. Let us give thanks for this opportunity. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the material blessings in our jobs. As we give back, let us do so with a cheerful heart. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. If you'd like to at this time mark your song of invitation after the lesson will be number 668 come to Jesus 668 will be the song of encouragement after the lesson if you'd like to stand we'll sing number 248 before the lesson 248 I'll live in glory <clears throat> let's sing the first and last verse of this song <coughs> I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing love stories there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing, by faith I look away to yonder. Tell him 
sing the story there on high there with my dear redeemer no more to die oh yes i'll live in glory by and by good morning everyone Wonderful to have you all with us this morning. Uh, as many are likely aware of those of Smyrna, this is the first time that I've actually preached in quite some time. I think it's the first time that I've spoken here in this manner. So definitely have to bear with me as have not had this opportunity uh, in a while. But this morning I'd like to take a look at what does the Bible say about salvation? Looking at a few different questions along that topic line. Uh, if you look up the definition of salvation, uh, Merriam-Webster defines it as the deliverance from the power and effects of sin. It's also mentioned that it's the preservation from destruction or failure, those being just a couple of the definitions of salvation. A simple definition that we might look at is it is the deliverance or being saved from something, especially in our discussion, uh, being saved from sin. So the first question I'd like to look at this morning is, where is salvation not found? First off, salvation is not found within ourselves. In Proverbs 14:12, uh, we read about, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. While we can train our conscience, train our minds to be mindful of the things in which the Bible teaches, uh, we can still be wrong in our thoughts. We can be wrong in our beliefs and what we may hold to be true. Because ultimately, the Word of God is the ultimate and accurate truth. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, we read that, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, that being God speaking, uh, nor are your ways my ways, says Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We see that God and his thoughts are higher and more than our own thoughts. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we see that we are not saved uh, of ourselves, that is through uh, our own works, our own meritorious works uh, that we have done in order to put God into our debts, the things that uh, we've done to do so much good that God owes us. That is not how we are saved, but is, it is through God's grace being given to us as that free gift. In Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, we see that while most people believe in God, uh, or act morally, are considered a good person, a good individual in uh, the world's eyes, or even, as some would like to say, that they are very religious, we see the, which way the majority will enter. Uh, it's said there in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, that the majority uh, is going to enter by that wide and that broad way that leads to destruction. And as we looked in the definition of salvation, uh, part of that definition is to being saved or delivered from destruction. Salvation is also not found in the world. As we mentioned there, that most or the majority of people will enter into that wide and broad way. In Matthew 16, verses, or verse 26, we see that... Uh, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So even if we were to gain the whole world but lose our own soul, it would be of no profit. So we cannot find our salvation in the world. In James 4.4, 4, it says that, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Having that friendship or following just as the world does 
being uh, similar to or being of no difference than the world, we can find ourselves being an enemy of God. In Romans 12, 2, it said that uh, we are not to be uh, conformed to this world, but transformed. We're also told uh, in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, that we're to not to love the world or the things in it. For the things in the world, that being the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Then in John 18, verse 36, we see that Jesus speaks that his kingdom is not of this world. We see so many, many of these inferences and passages that uh, our hope and our trust should not be in the world, the things of the world. And lastly, where is salvation not found? Salvation is not found in any other. Uh, while there are several good people, according to the world and even us, good being that they are moral, that they do well in our sight, that they are a, just a good general person, uh, we cannot be saved by them. We cannot be saved by anyone other than Jesus. In Acts 4, verses 9 through 12, uh, we can see that being stated. Here we see Peter uh, telling the people that are gathered there that salvation can be found in no other name under heaven uh, but Jesus. Specifically there in the last of that little section in verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So going off of that last verse there, then we ask the question, where is salvation then found if it's not found in any of these? Salvation, just as mentioned here, is found in Jesus. As we just read here, salvation is found in no other name under heaven except through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. They're referenced in verse 10 as well of that passage. In Titus 2, verses 11 through 14, we see that the grace of God brings salvation or that brings salvation, has appeared to all men. That is the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're mentioned in Titus 2, verse 13. Uh, then just a few, uh, few pages back in 2 Timothy 2, 10, we also see uh, it read that, Therefore I endure all things, for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And then a familiar passage both to all of us likely here this morning and then even to the world. In John 3, 16 and then in 17, it mentions that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That everlasting life being uh, salvation that is being saved. And then in verse 17, that the world through him, through Jesus, might be saved. And then just a little later in the book of John, 14 verse 6, or John chapter 14 verse 6, we see Jesus talking about himself in that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. We see there that Jesus is the way, that being singular, that being uh, the only way, one way. Tonight we're going to look at the question of what does the Bible say about the church? As I referenced this morning in class, uh, the way is often called out uh, in Acts, or sometimes called out in Acts, referring to uh, the gospel, referring to the church. So here we see Jesus saying that he is the way, that being singular, that being the only way. Then in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, uh, we get a little more information or we look at there. Look at how many times the phrase in him is referenced or in Christ is stated. Just through those few verses, it's mentioned several different times. 
We see in verse 3 that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. And then in verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Because without the forgiveness of sins, we would be separated from God. We would be uh, hidden from Him. As mentioned in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, our iniquities have separated us from God. Our sins have uh, caused Him to hide, our fa or hide His face from us. Then going along with Ephesians 1 there, verses 3 and 7, we come to the question of being asked, well, what are the rewards or what are the benefits of having salvation? What are the benefits of being saved? As mentioned there in verse 3, we see that uh, forgiveness of sins is stated. And then in verse 7, rather, verse 3 talks about finding all spiritual blessings how many blessings are we given by God each and every day that we're alive? The song that we sing, Count Your Many Blessings. Uh, if we continue to count our blessings on a daily basis, uh, they would be unnumbered. We can continue to think about how many things God has given us. But specifically in this, God has given us the forgiveness of our sins through the blood of Jesus, His Son. Also, the benefit of being saved or the reward of salvation is fellowship with God. In 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7, we read about God being the light. God is light. And if we walk in that light uh, as He is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. Uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. We see that fellowship, that walking with one another, uh, indicates that fellowship with both God and us. Similarly, uh, I know that we've read about and have talked about before in Genesis with Enoch. Uh, Enoch walked with God, indicating that fellowship with God, that uh, relationship with God. Uh, also with Adam and Eve walking in the garden with one another. That fellowship and that uh, relationship with one another. In John 17, 21, in which is the Lord's Prayer, we see uh, Jesus praying for different, uh, different people there in chapter 17, uh, in those three different sections that are called out. Specifically, we're looking at verse 21, in which Jesus is praying for uh, the believers, or all Christians that we, those believers and those Christians, uh, all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So just as Jesus and God the Father are one and are in fellowship with one another, Jesus here is praying for those Christians that would come, that we too should be uh, one in Christ and one with the Father as well. That fellowship, walking one with another. Then we also see that we receive eternal life through being saved. In Romans 6, 23, we see that uh, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We see verse 623, the first part of there. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we can receive that benefit of having eternal life. That's also referenced there in John 3 that we just read about as well. Another question that we must ask. What does it mean then to be lost? What does it mean to not be saved? or to not have that salvation. As we look there in the first part of Romans 6, 23, it says the wages of sin is death. That which we deserve, the wages that we earn because of our sins is death. However, the gift of God, that which was freely given to us, something that we did not uh, do enough to earn God's debt to give us something, 
but it was a free gift given to us, uh, that being Christ, Jesus, his son. Then earlier in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, we read that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we know that all have sinned and are lost if we have sinned, then our wages, or that which we deserve, is death. But, thankfully, as we'll look at here in the, just a few minutes, we do have hope in spite of that fact. Similarly, in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, as we looked at earlier, we see that we are out of fellowship with God if we have sinned. Our sin separates us from God. It hides his face from looking upon us. So then the question becomes, then how is someone uh, to be saved? How is someone attain that salvation that we're looking at? The simple answer to that is the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of God's Son. There are several verses uh, that we're going to look at that points to the blood of Christ in which that saves us, and even some that we've already looked at uh, before. Continuing on in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, we see that even while we were yet sinners, uh, God sent his only son uh, in order to die for our sins. Having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. I know I'm not the first one to point out or even to mention this, but it's something that I've heard other preachers say in times past that justified, uh, just like we've been studying uh, with James uh, on these Sundays previous about repentance and the forgiveness of sins. I've heard it said that uh, justified is similarly saying that just if I had never sinned, God forgets and forgives our sins whenever we repent of those sins and pray for forgiveness. He will no longer remember those sins against us. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, we take a look at uh, that being uh, a well-known chapter of, the, uh, of Paul discussing the resurrection, uh, attesting that the resurrection of Jesus did happen and it was confirmed. And because of that, uh, our own resurrection is sure. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, in verses 3 and 4, we see that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and then following there in verse 5 and the next few verses, and that he was seen by several people. We see the confirmation of that resurrection and through that resurrection, we have that uh, hope of salvation, of how we attain that salvation. Then in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 28, we see the comparison of animal sacrifices during the Old Testament times of the law of Moses and the prophets compared to that of the sacrifice of Jesus. The Old Testament sacrifices of those animals being uh, lesser and not sufficient or in comparison with the uh, perfection of Jesus and that's in his sacrifice. As it's mentioned there in the last verse of chapter 9, in verse 28, we see that Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So Christ being offered as our perfect and eternal sacrifice once, not yearly or as often as they did during the Old Testament times of uh, Moses and that law, but once for all time that we can have that salvation through his sacrifice. So the question then becomes, one that so many of us in times past have asked and likely in times in the future will continue to ask. What must I do to be saved then? What do I need to do in order to attain that salvation? That is the question that we're looking at. 
as I mentioned in Bible class this morning, we've been looking through Acts chapter, or Acts really, several different chapters, some more so than others, about what people did in order to be saved, what they were told, what they were instructed. In Acts 22, we see that specific question asked by the Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we see there, and we'll look at in the future in that study of Acts, of what was done at that point and what was uh, required of them in order to be saved. Similarly, in Acts chapter 2, in which we have already looked at and discussed, uh, we see those men and those people at, on Pentecost ask the question, uh, what must I do? Uh, in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, that, or sorry, 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? Hearing that they had crucified the Son of God, hearing the, uh, hearing the consequences of their actions for not believing, not understanding that this Jesus of Nazareth whom they had just heard uh, teaching for the, these last several years was the Christ, was the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament, that they had now crucified him. So they, being lost in their sins, now needed to ask that question, what must I do, or what shall we do? So as we've looked about where is salvation found, salvation is found in Christ, in Jesus, uh, through his blood, in which that we find that forgiveness of sins and that uh, salvation. Hebrews 11.6, it talks about, uh, but without faith, it's impossible to please him who sent, or it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we see that we can't be pleasing unto God if we don't believe uh, believe in him, believe that God is who he said he was, believe that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was the son of God, that he did uh, die for the remission of our sins, that his blood washes away our sins like we've looked at in Acts so many times. Romans ten seventeen that we so often hear, uh, hear quoted by those speaking here and those who we listen to at other times. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We looked in Hebrews 11 saying that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. That faith produces uh, belief or that hearing produces faith. That faith produces uh, belief and obedience to the things in which that are taught. In John 8, 24, it said that, uh, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins uh, if you do not believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. So we know that we must believe uh, in Jesus, believe that he was the son of God. We see in Luke 13, 3 and 5 that uh, if you, if we, sorry, read the wrong passage there. In Luke 13, 3 and 5 it says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, one to, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in Romans 6, 3 and 4, and a few verses in that instance, this is where we find out how to get into Christ. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So we see that baptism is what gets us into Christ Jesus where all spiritual blessings are found, where the forgiveness of sins is at, and where Jesus' blood is applied to our souls for the forgiveness of sins. Similarly, there in Galatians three twenty seven. We see that for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And like we had looked at earlier, 1 Corinthians 15, that being that resurrection chapter, as Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again, and was seen by so many others. Even so, through baptism, 
Uh, also, we are buried with Christ in that Christ was raised from the dead. Even so, we should also be raised to walk a new lifestyle according to God's word. And then there in Revelation 2.10 that also here often that we are to live that Christian life, to walk in that new lifestyle in order to be pleasing to God. That's often referred to as uh, the plan of salvation. Uh, I've had it asked a time before, uh, who, who created that? Who came up with that? Because I'd say a lot of the times in denominationalism, in denominations we see that uh, a man-made creed talks about how to be saved. Well, this plan of salvation is not made by any man. It's not made by me or any other preacher that's spoken in times past. It's simply read in the scriptures, read in the Bible of what one must, must do in order to be saved, in order to become a Christian, in order to obtain that salvation that we've been looking at this morning. But if we have become a Christian, have been living that Christian life, but perhaps we've stumbled along the way, like I'd mentioned earlier, we've been looking at repentance, the forgiveness of sins. If we've made those mistakes as a Christian and have sinned, we need to follow like Acts chapter 8 with Simon that we've looked at in times past. That example, that he, uh, once realizing that he has made a mistake because someone had told him of it, shown him the ways of his error, or the error of his ways, that he needed to repent of those sins to change his mind, to change his lifestyle in order to be pleasing unto God once more. That he needed the prayers of those with him in order to have that forgiveness of sins. So as a Christian, if we've, all, if we've already become that Christian and have sinned, fallen short of that glory of God that we've read about that all men have done, but if we are no longer walking in fellowship with God, then we need to follow that example. Ask for the forgiveness of sins. If that's a prayer between you and God directly, take care of that. That's the only people that needs to know about it, if it's just between you and the Lord. If it's between you and others, we need to make uh, corrections with that. Go to those people and make corrections with that uh, uh, individual, whether that be another Christian or someone of the world, so that way we do not bring that shame upon the church uh, that we're told not to. And then to ask for the prayers of the church, uh, because our sin is so greatly wide known and widespread that we're not able to take care of it ourselves. So this morning, whether it's you've never become a Christian, that you want to attain that salvation, We've looked at that, and we looked at where that's at. That is in Christ. We've heard the word of the Lord spoken. Most of my uh, lesson this morning was uh, coming directly from scriptures. As I mentioned in Bible class, uh, hearing a sermon this week, uh, it helped point my lesson in a direction. But going from scripture to scripture is one way to... Make sure that you are right in what you are believing, what you are reading. But we cannot uh, pull out those scriptures and take them out of context. And all of the passages that I've quoted, I encourage you to look at those in context. Make sure that they are saying what they are said. If they're not, please tell me. I need to correct my teaching, my thinking. Uh, but if they are correct, then we need to make sure that we're following those to the best of our abilities. So this morning, whether you need to become a Christian for the first time or to uh, become or come back to God in that you are already a Christian and need the prayers of the church, uh, please do so. Uh, please come to the center pew that's uh, been left open for you uh, as together we stand and as we sing. Come to Jesus, come.
to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come, come today. Come to Jesus. Dying sin. Other Savior, there is none. He will share. Let us pray together. Our divine heavenly Father, we're thankful for this time that we've had to been together to study from your word and to hear your word taught. We're thankful for David and his ability to present your word from your from the Bible. We thank for the many scriptures he gave us on salvation. We continue to ask our blessings to be with him as he continues to pray and prepare himself to present your word in a public way as he did today. Father, we are thankful for each one that's present. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we meditated on that word, that we will grow stronger in the faith. We're thankful for Christ and for his sacrifice that he made on Calvary, that through the shedding of his blood and our obedience to the gospel, that we can be added to the Lord's church where the saved are. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for all that are present today, we ask thy blessing to be with those that are not able to be with us. We ask that their best of care be given to them, that their health might improve. We pray for those that have lost loved ones. We pray that you would comfort them in this time and they may look to you for help and guidance. For all these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> 